occupying. Dr. David Jeremiah, founder of Turning Point and senior pastor of Shadow Mountain Community Church in San Diego, has become one of the world's most sought after Christian leaders. He connects modern culture and current events to biblical prophecy. He says the headlines are jarring with terrorism that bleeds across borders, a growing culture of apathy, and escalating international tensions. The future seems uncertain for everyone. In his latest book, Is This the End? Dr. Jeremiah gives a biblical perspective on topics affecting our society and the role we play in changing our world. Oh, well, please welcome to the show, live via satellite, Dr. David Jeremiah. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, what's, what's the root cause of America's decline? Well, you know what, uh, Gordon, when you, when you come to the conclusion that, that God is not the creator and, and we are not uh, creations of the Almighty God, you have no one to report to, and pretty soon everyone is doing that which is right in their own eyes. And that's what's happened. Uh, one of the chapters in this book is called The Age of Anything Goes, and that's where we are today. Um, do, you, do you see a further erosion of our religious freedom? Is that, is that sort of the next step for our culture? I believe that's, that's going to happen unless we have an intervention, some sort of uh, a sixth great awakening or, or something of that nature, because there's nothing standing in the way. We, we just seem powerless to, to stop it. It's just little by little, one by one, uh, our freedoms are being taken from us. I keep wondering what's going to get us to wake up. I mean, it, it, it just seems to be um, uh, a whole series of cataclysms, uh, starting with, uh, let's just take the past 16 years. You, you go back to 9-11 to and uh, go back to the election right before that. We couldn't figure out who was elected president uh, the day after the election. Mm -hmm. Then you have 9-11. Uh, then you have a huge stock market crash, the economy's in shambles. All of them seem to be wake-up calls, but uh, wh why do we continue to slumber? Because we always figure out some way to bail ourselves out enough so that we feel comfortable going forward. One of the great uh, evidences uh, of, of the history of revival is that revival in this, in this nation happened when all hope was gone. I think that's what people miss, and that is there have been times in America that have been a lot worse than where we are right now, and it was at that moment when God intervened. I guess you'd have to say we just haven't, we haven't fallen far enough yet for, uh, for us to realize that our only way is to look up. You mentioned personal revival in the book. Why is that so important? Well, you know, it's so easy for us to talk about revival as a generality, but revival always starts with one person. When I go back and read the history, for instance, Jeremiah Lanfear announced a prayer meeting in New York City, uh, and nobody came. But then somebody came, and then before it was over, 50,000 people were praying every noon uh, in, in New York City. That was one of the great awakenings in our country. Revival starts in our own hearts, and if we don't look first inward, uh, then, then it will not happen. Uh, what, what can we do as Christians to trigger that event, um, to trigger that kind well, we, of revival? You know, yeah. It's kind of funny to me because I grew up in a pastor's house, and, and my father used to announce revivals, but uh, they weren't exactly the, the kind of revivals we're talking about right now. Revival starts uh, as, as God intervenes, and all we can do is prepare the way. We can get the kindling ready for the fire through self-examination, through prayer, and, and, you know, the great revival passage says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and confess their sins. That's a pretty good start right there. That's a very good start. Well, let's turn to the Middle East. Uh, we look at the rise of ISIS, uh, the rise of Iran. Uh, now Turkey seems to have ambitions to expand, and they're becoming... Uh, not a secular Muslim country, but a, a religious Muslim country. Uh, the rise of Russia again. Are, are, are we, uh, as your title suggests, is this the end? Well, I don't have any uh, inside information about whether this is the end. I would have to say immediately that's not the answer. No, we're not immediately at the end. But things are happening now that have never happened before. For instance, you mentioned Russia. 
Ezekiel uh, 38 and 39 tell the story of Russia, and it's being lived out in front of us, including the other nations that you mentioned, which are part of a northern coalition that comes against Israel uh, right before the tribulation period. Those things are all kind of moving into position in a way that startles us because, let's face it, we thought Russia was history. Uh, yeah, we did. Um, and uh, I've lived in a world where I thought Turkey was a friend of Israel. Uh, I, I never thought I'd ever see a, a Russian air base in Syria. Uh, and I never thought I'd mm -hmm. see the United States in this sort of strange alliance with Iran uh, trying to deal with ISIS in Iraq. Uh, and it's almost like we're not concerned at all. Well, what happens if Iran takes over all of that territory? Uh, mm -hmm. is, is that a consolidation of, of power in a state sponsor of terrorism? Uh, I've never expected to see that kind of world uh, play out in my lifetime. When I first started to talk about Russia some years ago and its relationship with Iran, people looked at me like I was crazy, that that never would happen. And then these last months have been just overwhelmingly uh, prophetic because the relationship between Iran and Russia and uh, the nations that are listed in the Northern Coalition, I think three or four of them are from Turkey. And so when you study the Bible, it's kind of like, oh, so that's what that's all about. And what I tried to do in this book is just lay out the foundation of what the Bible says about many of these issues. Not to, not to say, okay, here's when Jesus is coming back. Nobody has the right to do that, and we, we should never do that. We cannot know the time, but we sure can know the season, and I believe we're in that season. Uh, what would you say to Christians? I, I'm, I'm getting a sort of sense we all need to be doomsday preppers and go off to the mountains and uh, store up a bunch of food. Uh, what, what, what should Christians be doing in this season? You know what, uh, this is the greatest time we have ever had for the gospel. I believe that with all my heart. I am more uh, motivated and sense a greater uh, sense of urgency in my own heart to reach people f for, for Christ. Rather than uh, wor working on our own self-preservation, this is a time for us to share the gospel in every way possible, everywhere possible, and uh, that's where I think our focus ought to be. It's interesting what happens when you get your focus on that. You quit worrying about your own safety and all the stuff that's going on around us. You know, the darkness provides a great background for the light of the gospel. Amen and amen. I couldn't agree more. Let's get more people in the lifeboat. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. We need a lot of laborers in the harvest. Amen. Field. Yeah. Well, thanks for the book. We do. Uh, and thanks for being with us. And again, the book is called, Is This the End? It's available now.